Good afternoon. Okay then, let's, let's get started. Thanks very much for coming along. I know it's a walk from another building. How are we doing? Okay. How are we doing, okay? Good. I'm glad you're okay. Let's get, let's get started then. So, uh, thank you very much for coming along. I know it's a walk from another building. Today, in our lecture, what are we looking at? Well, firstly, and apologies for me in terms of the materials only going online this morning. That's completely useless for you. I'm sorry. I promise not to do it again. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to do some learning by questions. The idea with this is to reinforce the concepts, but also to practice for the examination, uh, which I'm sure you'll all be interested in. So these are the type of questions we're going to do using Mentimeter today that are going to prepare you for the examination. The topics that we're going to look at then, so uh, feeding back on what you'd like to recap, we're going to look at infrared sensing, we're going to look at absolute optical encoders, we'll have a quick look at... Um, uh, there's something else in there, strain gauge sensing as well, which I've missed off. Then we're going to have a go, go at our MCQ tests and answers. And at the end, we'll have the results of the self-assessment quiz to see who's going to win the little prize that I've organised for you. And we're going to talk a little bit about the sensing that's involved in that prize so you can, uh, you're aware of it. Uh, and then at the, at the end, it's just a bit of an opportunity for you to give me some feedback. Believe it or not, we're in week seven, so we're already halfway through the course. So, um, uh, opportunity for you to feedback on what, one thing that's going well about the unit and one thing that you'd like to improve. So, we'll have a look at that. So, thank you very much for the feedback um, in terms of what you want to look at. Let's crack on and look at these three things then. So, absolute optical encoders, strain sensing and infrared sensing that a couple of folk have flagged to me 
um, is something you want to have a look at. So what are absolute optical encoders? So unlike normal optical encoders, where we just have, you can imagine it as though it's a rotating disc, and we've got an, uh, an infrared LED over here, and that disc has gratings on it, so at some points it will let the light through, and at other points it won't. Well, if I just rotate that disc, and you count the number of lights, you know the speed, and you also know how far it's moved, if you know what the angular distance is between each of those gratings. Okay, so if it's 360 degrees, you've got 100, 100 gratings. 360 divided by 100 mean each flash of light is 3.6 degrees. Okay, time that for a period of, uh, count the number of pulses in a period of time, and you know what the velocity is. Okay, so we can work out position and velocity. Now, the problem is that, is with a single optical encoder, so if we've just got one LED, we know that it's rotating, but we don't know whether it's going clockwise or anti-clockwise. And this is where a quadrature optical encoder comes in. It's called quadrature, but it only has two sensing elements in it. So we've got two lights now, and we, 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 we position our lights carefully so that they're not both, um, so that we know which direction is rotating by whether A comes on before B or B comes on before A. So by knowing that information, you can work out the angular change, the velocity, and the direction of travel. And it's called a quadrature encoder because we've got four states. Yeah? Imagine we've got sensor A and sensor B. They can either both be high, both be low. A can be high and B can be low. Or A can be low and B can be high. So we've got four states. So that's a quadrature encoder. And the final type of encoder is called an absolute optical encoder. And unlike the incremental encoders, which just tell us how far we've uh, travelled, they have a bit of a problem to them. And the problem with that is that if you switch your system off and you switch it on again, yes, you can count how much you've rotated, but you don't know where you started. So you don't, imagine being on a clock face and it's rotating. Well, I can count how far it's moved round, but I don't know whether it started at one o'clock or two o'clock or three o'clock. With an absolute optical encoder, it, it's called absolute because it enables us to understand the absolute position. And the way we do that is we have a series as we look across the radius of this disc of areas where it will let light through and areas where light won't go through. And we have multiple beams of infrared radiation and multiple receivers. And what it enables us to do is, depending on whether those are low or high, we can work out exactly what that position is, okay, within a certain re resolution. That's the principle of an absolute um, optical encoder. And if we go on to the next slide and we run this little video, hopefully that illustrates what it is. So we've got our beams of infrared radiation here. They're either letting uh, through um, light or not, and that's just going to tell us what position we are on that disc. This has only got three small beams. The more beams that you have, the more accurate it is. Tell me. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, re really obvious. We're interested in position here. So that might be, I want to know what the position of my arm is. Okay, so it might be a robotic joint. Okay, or it might be the position of uh, a wheel. Okay, on a, on a rover. Okay, absolutely. We're interested in rotational position here. So that's the principles of an absolute optical encoder. What about strain sensing? So strain get sensing uh, is a really important fundamental type of, of sensing. It enables us to uh, understand how things are uh, def deflected. It's often used in measuring vibration. So uh, for those aerospace students here, really commonly used on aircraft wings to understand what your uh, displacements are as a function of time. The commonest type of strain gauge is a foil strain gauge. It looks a little bit like we can see in the diagram over here, where we've got a, um, let me just put my laser pointer on to make it a bit easier for you to see. If I can see my cursor, there we go. Great, there we go. It looks something like this here. So we've got a, a strain gauge. And the principle is, is as we deflect that, the resistance changes. You've got a grating, and as you deflect it, the resistance changes. So if I, if I apply a voltage across it, as the resistance changes, the amount of voltage that drops across it changes. And if we relate one to the other, then we know how much has been deflected. Okay, so it measures the strain in the system. Um, so a change in tension changes the resistance. 
and it's the least expensive type of gauge that we can use. They're really widely used across all different types of application. In fact, um, I'm just doing a, a project at the moment where we're looking at um, a really important um, concept. So diabetes is a big problem for people globally. Um, diabetic foot ulceration leads to about 8,000 people a year having some form of amputation of their foot. And one of the things that um, clinicians have been saying for many years is we want to be able to measure what the strain is in the shoe. And we're using some strain gauges like this to measure that. So we put them in the shoe and they deflect and we can work out what the normal forces are that are applied and how much strain that we're getting in there. So really, really quite low, low cost systems um, that we can um, bond to systems to look at. Um, they're not suitable over long distances. Why? Well, here you've got a wire grating, and that's great for electromagnetic fields like radio waves inducing voltages in there. Okay, so they're really quite susceptible to electromagnetic noise. And as we've looked in previous lectures, if I have my strain gauge over here, and then I have meters and meters of cabling over to my sensing system, I can have a problem. The outputs of these things are usually millivolts or microvolts. So that means the signal-to-noise ratio can be pr particularly problematic if we've got some uh, other form of um, induced voltage there. So yeah, they're susceptible to electromagnetic interference. They're also sensitive to moisture and humidity, unsurprisingly. We've got conductive grating. If you get moisture in there, then you're going to change the conductivity. Um, they're usually sandwiched within a mylar um, sheet to protect them. There are other types of strain gauges that we can, we can see here. So we've got vibration wire strain gauges which determine strain from the frequency of an AC signal. Um, you can see these are really rather bulky in comparison to the foil strain gauge. Um, they can't be used for dynamic uh, measurements. You've also got uh, fiber optic gauges which are the, the real advantage of those is they're, not, they're completely immune to electromagnetic radiation because it's an optical system. So radio waves aren't going to affect it. Uh, the problem is, is um, with optical systems, they're quite fragile. If you, I'll come to you in a second. You can imagine if we've got um, you know, glasses and fiber optics and they vibrate, then we may snap them and they may come to a problem. Tell me. Uh, how much detail can the microscope explain, for example, if you like, label the outbox for It could be, yeah. It could be. Uh, yeah, just like any other exam. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. You're going to see some, something about the types of questions that you'll be asked. Um, before the examination, you have three practice exams to do, okay? And you'll have already seen that we've started to do some of these practice questions in lectures, and also we're going to do some of them today. Don't, don't if, you, if you do the work, I won't ask you anything particularly nasty. There'll be harder questions and easier questions, but yeah, I can ask you this, this concept about sensing, okay? Thanks. Um, so yeah, this type of strain gauge, yeah, immune to EM um, electrostatic noise, the compact size, they're pretty high cost in comparison to foil strain gauges, uh, and they're also fragile. So infrared sensing, so the infrared uh, magnetic spectrum is an area of the spectrum that we can see here. Um, it's outside of our visible light, so we can't see it. Um, and, and it's quite a powerful uh, medium for sensing. Uh, the simplest type of sensor that we have here is a brake beam sensor. So I have a, an LED, you can look at it, you won't see anything, it's infrared so we can't see it, and a sensor, and if something breaks that beam, well, we don't get a signal. If something isn't in the way of the beam, then we do get a signal. So a simple light gate they're often referred to, so they'll be used for things such as measuring how quickly somebody can run on a racetrack, okay? Simple automated stopwatch. Uh, another type of infrared sensor is a reflective sensor. What we do here is we have our emitter and our um, our emitter and our receiver kind of next to each other and we bounce something off at an angle and we look at the angle at which it comes back okay and by measuring where it hits on that sensor we know what that angle is and we can work out what the distance is with some trigonometry so a particularly powerful way of looking at things um, and this is a um, increase in ambient light raises the DC bias so um, infrared radiation once we can't see it it's all around us so when we go outside there's infrared radiation from the sun. So if we just rely on a threshold, i.e. if something is above a certain level of infrared radiation or below it, it switches on or off, well, that's not great. Imagine your TV is controlled by an um, infrared signal and it's just intensity-based. If it's intensity-based 
and it gets really sunny, that would change your channels. So it's not particularly useful. Okay? So we call this the DC bias. So here we can see in the top image, this is great because my switching on and off staggers either side of the ambient threshold. However, in the bottom one, now it isn't. So now whether we switch it on or off, there's too much infrared radiation, so it isn't going to make a difference. Let me just play you this image. Is that going to let me do that? No, it's not. Let's explain this one then. So this is what we were talking about in terms of distance again. So we can see on the top one, our sensor system is further away from the wall. On the bottom one, it's closer to the wall. And we can see that it's going to re make a different angle with the object that it reflects off. And uh, it's going to... Um, is going to be uh, incident on a different point on our sensing element. And by reading where it is incident on this sensing element, we can work out what the distance are, just with some simple geometry. So quite a powerful system. So how do we overcome the challenge that we have with um, ambient uh, infrared radiation? We can use a technique known as mod... Hello? What, what's the point? Okay, so a parking sensor on a car. You could use this as a parking sensor on the car. So when it gets close to the wall, it makes a different angle. And if you pre-calibrated it, you know how far away from the wall you are. So it's a sensing system for measuring what dis distance is. Yeah, because if, uh, let me go back a slide and explain. The closer I am to the wall, the different angle I'm gonna get from my reflection. And the different the angle, that means it's going to hit at a different point. On my, if you imagine that sensing signal being a strip, if it hits at the bottom, it's one angle. If it hits at the top, it's a different angle. And if we calibrate that with an experiment, then we can work out exactly what our distance is by where it hits on the strip. Is that, is that easier? Yeah? Great. Good question. So uh, modulation and demodulation. So how do we solve our problem with the, uh, the background levels of infrared radiation? One way of doing this is to use a modulator and demodulating system. And basically, it's a flashing light source of particular frequency. So I've got my infrared beam, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch it on and off very quickly. Okay? Maybe at, at 40,000 times per second. And this is a power source system because it allows you... Uh, so a demodulator is tuned to the specific frequency, so I said 40 uh, kilohertz. Um, the flashes of light can be detected even if they're very weak. What we do is we take our signal and we remove our time domain signal into the frequency domain. And what we're looking for now, although we're using infrared radiation, which is a particular frequency, what we're actually interested in is, is there a signal at the frequency which I'm switching on and off at? So I look at it and I say, okay, I'm firing my infrared radiation and I'm switching it off at 40 kilohertz. In the frequency domain, do I have a peak at 40 kilohertz? And if I do, my sensor, my signal is there. If I don't, then I don't. And that's completely immune to the background level of infrared radiation because it's not an intensity main system. You're using a modulation and demodulation approach to doing that. So it's really quite powerful, and this is the basis of how TV remote controls work. So it's susceptible to ambient lighting and the reflectivity of the object that we may have. Um, it's used in most uh, infrared remote control units and proximity sensors. So a really common way of sensing. Uh, another way to look at this is graphically. So we can see at the top here, we've got our infrared radiation. And all we do is switch the LED on or switch it off at a particular uh, frequency. And here we can see um, our, our demodulator output is either it's detecting that, uh, that vibrating frequency or it's not. So we know whether it's on or off. So an easy way to, to get around the challenge that we have with intensity-based infrared systems. <coughs> and it looks something like this, as a little illustration. So on the left-hand side is the input from our, our uh, signal generator. We're reading that, and then we're using our demodulator to say, is our system on or off? Zero volts means off. Five volts means that it's on. Okay. Any questions on that content? Tell me. Mm -hmm. uh, so why is it when they touch they go down? Yeah, so I guess, I guess it's just inverted. But you could have it either way around. You set up the system. In lab view, you just use a knock gate, right? To just switch, switch between zero or one. 
An, uh, so a NOT gate, an analog NOT gate, so a NOT gate um, inverts your signal. So if I have a zero or a true into a NOT gate, it turns it into a false. Or if I have a false as an input, it turns it into a true. Any other questions? We okay? Good. So let's have a look at our MCQ quiz then. So you're going to need to log into Menti. The, your final MCQ exam? Nope. This one now, try, try and do it without it being open book. But, but if, if, if you want to look at your, your stuff to try and work out the questions, that's okay. Yeah? The real exam won't be open book. That will be a closed book system. Okay? Um, this, if you want to look at your notes, I, I don't really mind. But just to kind of get familiar. Okay. Let me switch inputs here. Uh, I can't remember this week. I, if you look at your weekly learning plan, I can't remember whether there's a self-assessment quiz in there or not. Probably not if I'm doing this with you now. This should help you to assess your knowledge of the content. Okay. Okay. So if you go to Menti and you log in there, that would be great. see people log in we'll wait till we've got what looks like the right number so I'll give you a couple of minutes between each question okay so you can you can, if you want to talk to your colleague about it that's absolutely fine what are we doing 38 41 just give you one more minute Okay, looks like we've stabilised there. So, the first question is, the intensity-based infrared remote control for a retro TV doesn't work on a sunny day. What is the best solution to solve, resolve this problem? Should be good at this, we've just covered it. This is an example, remember with the MCQ uh, test, I will ask questions which are the kind of fundamental basics, at which there'll be about 40%, to see whether you meet the, the criteria for the, the right amount of knowledge to pass the unit. But then remember, you know, for the 80 to 100%, there's going to be a few questions on there that are really quite hard, okay? So we're going to get different levels of difficulty with our MCQ type questions. Okay. I think you've all done that. Let's go through the answer to that. So answer A was increase the strength of the infrared emitter. Um, that won't resolve the problem. Okay. It might resolve it temporarily, but it depends on how strong the background infrared radiation is. So that would only be a temporary fix. So not the best solution. Use a physical wire. Okay. Maybe not the, the most sensible thing. I don't know if any of you have a television with a remote control with a, a, a wire attached to your TV, probably not, not the most usable uh, solution, um, so it doesn't allow us to go wireless. Um, use a modulator, a demodulator, exactly, because modulating and demodulating the signal takes away the problem that we have with the background uh, infrared radiation. Train your dog to change the channel for you. There's always a few people that vote for that one. Great for this quiz, please don't put that in the exam because that definitely wouldn't be the right answer. Okay, next question then. Uh, no, it means that you know that you have to do a bit of more revision. Okay. Tell me, sir. Does it need to be co configured? Yes, you'd have to set up a system. It's not particularly difficult. Um, you could just have a, effectively your input to the signal uh, to the TV could still be the same but you could design a little bit of a box of electronics with your MIDAC systems 
okay, to, ch to change those signals into the right format. So you could add a third component in there and design it yourself. In fact, you all have enough skills already to do this should you want to. The TV is expecting the same input, but you could design a box in between that does, that, uh, that, that does those calculations for you and then gives the right input to the television. So you could do it by retrofitting. Okay, next question. So an electrical isolation circuit is important because it can... Which of the following are correct? This is an example of a multiple answer um, multiple choice question. So in the examination, some of them will be a single answer, and I will tell you if I want a single answer, and some of them will be multiple answers, and you have to get all of the multiple answers correct to get the mark for the question. There'll be, I'll come to you in a second, there'll be more questions this year which are multiple answers than previous years. So I think there's probably about 14 questions this year that will be multiple answers. Tell me. There's no negative marking in my MCQs. And I, I, I've designed them uh, based on previously what I do beforehand is I estimate what the difficulty level is, okay? And difficulty is how difficult the question is and whether it's multiple choice or not. I split the subject between some of them being sensing and the other DAQ and hardware elements and some of them are, are lab view and that's roughly about a 50-50 split. And what I look is I'm looking for that nice bell-shaped distribution and every, I've been doing it for 10 years, the first couple of years not so good, but the last few years I've got quite good at getting that, the correct distribution around the average that we should get. Tell me. Yeah, some, some, some of those may be correct. Yeah, if it's a multiple answer one, that means more than one answer is correct. That, so, so let me, if you let me, I'll just explain. So. If it's a multiple answer question, it's either two answers are correct, three answers are correct, or four answers are correct. Does that answer your question? Yes, I mean, um, if there's not multiple answers are correct, you should go for multiple You wouldn't get the mark. You wouldn't get the mark. No, because you got the question wrong. No, so if the, if, the question, if the question has A, B, C, and D is the answer, and the correct answers are A and B, if you write A and B, you get the mark. If you write anything other than A and B, you don't get a mark. Okay. So let's go through the answer to this question. So an electrical isolation circuit is important because it can stop an engineer from being electrocuted is correct. If you're working with high voltage systems, so you're working for network rail or the national power grid, okay, you don't want to plug your, da your data acquisition system straight into 40,000 volts. An electrical isolation circuit means that there's no direct electrical connection between your measurement system and the thing that you're measuring. So that will protect the engineer from getting an electric shock. It will reduce problems with improper grounding is also correct. And the product uh, protects sensitive measurement equipment from being damaged. That's also correct. Because we've got that, because there isn't a direct electrical connection, if we get a spike over here on our input, that doesn't transfer over to our uh, sensitive DAQ equipment. And these may be, you know, the, these DAQ systems may cost tens of thousands of pounds. They're not, they're not, they're not a low-cost system. Reduce the effects of high-frequency noise. No. High frequency noise isn't solved by having uh, an electrical isolation circuit. We'd solve that with a filter. If we wanted to solve that problem, we would have a low pass filter, which would let through it flu low, low frequency signals, but get rid of high frequency signals. Don't worry, I'll put the answers to these and your, um, your, your responses on Blackboard. So don't worry about taking them now. Okay, next question then. Your colleague has designed an amplifier with a gain in decibels of 25 dBs with an input signal of 0.5 volts. What is the output voltage? To calculate this, I'll, I'll give you a hint. The formula you need is the gain in decibels is equal 20, 
20 to the log base 10 of the voltage output over the voltage input. Just give you a couple of minutes. Okay, last minute on this one. Uh, no, I would expect you to know this, this formula. You won't get a formula sheet. I would expect you to know this formula. There's, there's not that many formulas in the course that you'd need to remember. No. No, not at all. Okay, let's have a look at the solution to this then. So here's our formula. The gain in decibels is equal to 20 log to the base 10 of G, where G is V output over V input. I know that my gain was 25 dB, so that goes on the left-hand side of my equation. I know that my input to the system is 0 0.5 volts, so I put that in. If I rearrange my equation and plug the numbers into the calculator, you are allowed to bring uh, calculators into your examination. Okay, So non-programmable cal calculators, so do make sure you bring one of those with you, then you would find this. A lot, it looks like the majority of folk did the calculation correctly. Well done. Don't worry if you didn't. Reflect on this. It's probably a little bit more nasty uh, a question than I would ask because two of the solutions are quite close to each other. We've got an 8.89 and an 8.6. I'd probably avoid that in an exam um, just to make sure that you weren't making a simple rounding error. Okay? So that was the solution to that question. Let's move on then. Let's have a look at our next question. So which of the following, A to D, are factors in choosing sensors? More than one answer may be correct. Which of the following are factors in choosing sensors? More than one sensor. Li yeah, life, the lifetime of the sensor. Yeah, lifetime lifespan. Say you work for Airbus now, you've got to choose a sensor for an aircraft. This is the type of question that I'm asking you. Another minute, some folk are still voting. Yeah. 
Okay, looks like we've stabilised about there. So it's the following A to D of factors in choosing the census. The power consumption, yes, that is an important aspect. Okay, especially if we're doing something like an aircraft, or we've got like you know, if we're moving to electrification of systems, power consumption is really important. Okay, so yes, that is true. The lifetime of the sensor, yes, that's also important. Okay, let's say you know I, I deliberately chose the aircraft manufacturer as as the example. How long is the lifetime of the aircraft, and how long is the lifetime of the sensor? Okay. That's going to be a problem if the lifetime of the sensor is shorter than the lifetime of the aircraft unless we replace the sensors regularly because you don't want your sensors to break um, once your aircraft's stable. Okay, So the lifetime of the sensor is important. Economic factors. Yes, economic factors are also important. Okay, If the sensors are really, really expensive and you're making, I don't know, a product like a mobile phone, so each of these mobile phones has a nine degree of freedom initial measurement unit in it, okay, they cost pence now, when I did my PhD, they're nine, nine, X, um, nine degrees of freedom, when I did my PhD, one degree of freedom would be 50 pounds, okay, now they're pence, okay, so the cost of the sensor is also an important factor, the economic factors, the linearity of the system is also a technical factor which is important in choosing sensors, so the answer to this question is A, B, C, and D are all correct. So all of those answers are correct. Tell me. What is the linearity of a system? So that's how your output varies with your input. So if it's a linear system, that means it's a straight line, like y equals mx plus c. If it's nonlinear, that means you haven't got a straight line, you've got a curve, and that might be a parabola. Yes, yeah, so your, as you increase your input, it won't increase linearly, i.e. a straight line, it'll increase, maybe, it might be an exponential. An exponential would be a non-linear response. Lady next to you. Hello. Is there a... Uh, um, is there a... The, the maybe. Um, it depends on the type of sensor that you're using. You know, so um, some types of thermocouples aren't linear. So the sensor, you can't design one which is linear just because they're complete. I'll come to you in a second. Uh, just because they're based on the material properties. So it's not the case that I can always choose a sensor to operate the way I want it to. If, if, the, if it's determined by the material properties and the resistance, and that's a nonlinear function, then that's what it is. What I can do, or what you can do, is if you understand the relationship between inputs and outputs, you can linearize that mathematically. So if you know what that, if you do an experiment and you measure what that function is, then then you can convert that with an equation to make it a linear output. Good question. Tell me, sir. Yeah, you can compensate, which, which is kind of the answer that I, I was just answering there. So it's a nonlinear system, but provided you do an experiment and you can characterize the system performance, that, then you, you, you know what your input is. It's, effectively, it's just a lookup table. Okay? If, if you've got your output and you measure what the output is and you've already calibrated it so you know what the input is, well, you know what the input is, whether that's linear or nonlinear. Good question. Really good questions. Okay, let's have a look at the next one. So a sensor has an output of 0 to 5 volts. The DAQ system is a 4-bit with an input range of 0 to 10 volts. State two amendments to improve the DAQ system performance. So how are we going to improve this data acquisition system performance? What can we do? Which of these are correct?
okay, last minute. Okay, let's go through these then. So we're, we're trying to optimize the performance of the system. And really, to optimize the performance, we would like our sensor, okay, the output of the sensor, to match the range of the DAQ system. And here we can see the output is between 0 and 5 volts. But if we, if we multiply by a factor of 2, so we had an amplifier, it would better match the range of measurement of the DAQ system. So here, answer B, to amplify the sensor output with a gain of 2, is correct. Answer A, use an isolation circuit, isn't going to improve the performance. Okay? It may be if, if you were working with a high voltage system and you wanted to protect the circuit, okay, and you, you could protect it with an, uh, an isolator, but it's not going to improve the performance of the circuit. Use a, de a modulator circuit. This application isn't necessarily to do with a modulator or a demodulator. We're looking at optimizing performance. We don't apply a modulator and a, a demodulator to something like a strain gauge. So that's an erroneous answer. Use a higher bit system to improve the resolution. We're going to do, the next question is going to look at this concept of resolution, so we're going to focus on that in a second. But the higher the resolution, i.e. the number of bits, okay, here we've got a four-bit system, okay? So four-bit system means 10 volts, because our range is 0 to 10 volts, divided by 2 to the power 4. Okay? That's what our increments are. What am I on about? Look at your ruler. Your ruler has little increments of millimeters. Okay? If I got rid of the millimeters and it was just 0, 1 centimeter, 2 centimeter, 3 centimeter, that's a system with lower resolution. Okay? It's not so good. So to prove that, we want a higher number of bits. Let's do our last question, then, that focuses on reinforcing that concept. So here, a 4-bit DAQ system has an input range of 0 to 10 volts. Calculate the code width, so it's called the code width, or the resolution of the system. Okay, just one more minute. We've got a couple of things to get through, and I need to let you leave so you can get back to your other lecture. Okay, looks like everybody's voted on that. So let's have a look at the answer to this. So we've got 4-bit systems, so the code width is 10 volts divided by 2 to the power 4. 2 to the power 4 is 16, so our code width, so our resolution, is 0.625 volts. So it's not really a system with a high resolution, is it? Okay. If we wanted to increase that, and we did, I don't know, an 8-bit system, 2 to the power 8, 256, I think, um, a lot higher resolution. Okay. So those are the two ways that we can improve that. I'll put those... The, I put your responses and the correct answers on Blackboard for you to have a go. That's the first example of an MC, MCQ type questions. Before Easter, you will have three MCQ tests online with feedback on them for you to practice so you'll be familiar with it. So lots of opportunity to practice for the examination. Okay. So, the results of the self-assessment quiz then. So I had a look through this. Engagement hasn't been fantastic yet. Um, I suspect, looking at the number of folk here and the number of folk that should be here, I think you're probably folk who are having a go at those MCQ questions because the numbers look about right. Um, if you see your student ID number, I have no idea what my staff ID number is, so I will put these on Blackboard. But if you see your student ID number or go and check your student ID number, you'll see that you have been successful in winning 
the, uh, the small prize which I've organised for you. I will be e contacting all of you in due course about this. So, what is the prize? Your prize is to use one of these. This is a Unitree A1 quadruped robot. We'll be using it in the MACD uh, FOIO system. And let me talk to you a little bit about this, um, just for a few minutes, because it's all about sensing. The sensing that we have in here, we have foot pressure sensors in there, which measure what the pressure is in contact with the foot, so we can understand the dynamics of our system. We have electric motors which control the joint angles and we'll have things such as incremental optical encoders there to understand what the position of our, um, our uh, legs are and also the velocity of those so we can control those. So we've got position speed and torque commands. In the front of our robot we have this thing which is a multi-eye intelligence depth camera. Basically it's the way humans work. We have two eyes and by the relative positions of things as we move forwards and backwards we can work out in fear what the distance is away from objects. So this is called a, a stereo camera. So it enables, enables you to sense depth of between 0.3 and 10 meters. This is quite important if you want to autonomously access it to move somewhere because it can autonomously avoid objects that it gets closest to them. Um, this is an, uh, an example here of the uh, painted to power system. I was actually gonna show you. Okay, it doesn't look so it's animating. We'll have a look at that. Um, yeah, painted to sensitive foot contact. I mean, basically what we've got in here is we've got a little load cell which measures the amount of force. It's actually pretty simple. It's actually a, a rubber bung that we've got there. It's not as advanced, these robotic systems, as things that you may see in, in nature, such as your cat's foot, which is actually highly evolved. And, and, and uh, I mean, our hands have 17,000 mechanoreceptors in them, okay? This probably does like three. <laughs> Okay, so we're, we're, you know, thousands of times um, factors are, are not so good. Uh, the type of things that we can do with this, uh, we can see here. So this is just the robot in a room. We're using a LiDAR, which is spinning around to tell us what's inside the room and how to avoid and how we can move to it. So I hope that you will enjoy that. I have one last thing for you to do with the last three minutes, which is firstly for you to tell me one thing that you like about the course. If you don't like anything about the course, that's fine. You don't have to submit anything here. Um, I'm, I'm, not ask you, I'm not asking for you to, to flatter me and, and tell me what a good lecturer I am, or, or you may not agree, but just things that you like that you would like us to do more of, whether that's the MCQ style questions or, or the, the course materials, whatever it is. I'll just give you a second to fill that in, and then you'll have the opportunity to tell me the one thing that you would like to improve. Just give you a minute or two. Thank you. <coughs> I'll, I'll post everything that you submit and my, my response to those um, on, on Blackboard for you so I can see that I'm looking at your feedback. The idea with this is when it gets to the end of the unit and you do your UEQs, well, that's great for the next year, but not so great for you guys who want some amendments during the course. So this is so you can give me the feedback now, so hopefully that I can, uh, I can change it. Okay. I'll just give you 30 more seconds, and then we'll come on to the other one. Everyone happy if I change? No. You done? We okay? Okay. Next question then, Sen. Um, so one thing that you would make the course better? Yeah, absolutely. More than three hours worn. I completely agree with you. My apologies about that. I think you're absolutely right. How to lab view, yes. Program is always, you know, when your program doesn't work, it's the worst thing ever, you hate me, this is the worst unit you've ever done. And then when it works, oh, it was all fine. What a great unit. Program is pretty, uh, pretty binary. Okay, I'll leave that open for you because I can see my colleague is here to get ready for the next lecture. Thank you very much, everybody. I think you've got time to get to your other lecture. And uh, back to the group project next week.
See you all later. Take care. Thank you. Hello. No, that's okay. Of course you can. Okay. I'm struggling to understand the that's real okay. difference between sensors and transmitters. Okay. So, can you explain briefly what does that mean? Of, I've of read course. an example in of, the internet, but I didn't quite make of, sense. Of course you can. Can I ask you to go on to the discussion board and post your question there, and I would like that. The reason being is that you're asking a very sensible question, but I would like to answer. Is, is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. And then if you're still unsure, I'll meet you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, see ya. Of course, yeah, let me just let me just log out of this computer, just so my colleague can get ready for her lecture. Uh, can I remember how to do it? I think it's that one, and then sign out. Please, do you want to come down the end, and then we'll just get out of the way? Oh, yeah, you're, you're okay. all right, you just sort yourself out. Yeah, thank you very much. Please, come down here, yeah.